So anyway, in my hand, I have a really awesome plaque of the hymns, chapter of the, uh, of the year, large chapter, which was won by none other than you guys, Southern California. Give yourself a round of applause. So I'd like to call Clark, uh, our president, Clark Kegley, and you guys, uh, to come forward and accept the award officially, has his name on it. He is the president of our chapter. So let's give him a round of uh, round warm of applause. And then you guys just have to hum the music in the background, you know, the Academy Awards. I'm sure he's got a speech and we've got some Kleenex here if he's going to cry. So Clark, uh, congratulations on behalf of the chapter. Very, very cool. So um, any comments? Or? Sure. So I play the role of useless figurehead pretty well. Uh, there is a small army of people that made this possible for the second time in three years. So they're the ones that really deserve the award. And if you enjoyed Dr. Madison and if you enjoyed that panel even a little bit, those are the folks that have made it possible. So I am always impressed at how hard they work, how much time they volunteer to make these things possible. So I'll ask you to one more time give a round of applause for them. I introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Ram Chandani. Good. How'd I do? Good. All right. Dr. Sunny Ramshamdani currently is the medical director of the healthcare business and the medical home champion at Naval Medical Center in San Diego. In his role, he is leading efforts on the Integrated Health Community Initiative, whereby healthcare delivery of military beneficiaries is integrated with social wellness and health services, thus improving health outcomes and simultaneously lowering healthcare costs. He was selected as a White House Fellow and served as the Chief Medical Officer at the U.S. Office of Personal Man Personnel Management. There he was the lead clinician of the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, which serves 8 million beneficiaries, covers over 200 health care plans, and has an annual budget of $43 billion. Uh, he earned his uh, MPH from Harvard School of Public Health and his MD from the Yale School of Medicine. Please welcome me in having Dr. Ramsanjani as our presenter today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know it's just after lunch, so I got to make this a little bit exciting, or you know how these things can go, right? You know how these can go. We've been in a bunch of them, haven't we? All right, so uh, we're going to make this a little bit fun. What um, we're going to talk a little bit about today is how we can get to population health. What does that mean for payers? What does that mean for providers? What does it mean for healthcare systems? What does it mean for the technology sphere? Um, how can we do this? And we'll talk a little bit about the macro stuff, and then we'll drill down a little bit into the micro stuff of where, where we can actually uh, go. So we're going to talk about the difference between health and health care. It's one of my little peeves, and I'm sure that you guys know this too. People say, oh, that's the health system. It's not a health system. It's a health care system. Um, health system being the World Health Organization's definition. You can pick a lot of definitions, but 1946, the World Health Organization defined it as not merely the absence of disease, but rather the social, mental, and physical well-being of the individual. So are we getting to health, or are we just doing a lot of health care? Because, as we'll talk about, you guys don't really like health care for yourselves. You really like health. Um, so how do we deliver it to you? That's the, uh, that's the underlying kind of premise. And any entrepreneur who figures out how to deliver health, bravo, they're going to become gazillionaires. Um, all right, let's talk a little quickly before we set the stage. The same way syndrome. This is what I talk, we call that the same way syndrome. What's that up on the screen? So set this go. It's easy, right? Periscope, ophthalmoscope, colonoscope, microscope. I said telescope, Same right? What do all those scopes have in common? You look through them. Do you look through this? You called it a stethoscope, I think. Do you look through this? No, you don't. It's a misnomer, isn't it? It's a stethophone, really, when you think about it. But we don't think like that, because we're just doing it the same way, right? 
It's the same wave syndrome. It's a stethoscope. Of course it's a stethoscope. It's not like a telescope, right? Well, and maybe it's just vocabulary. Maybe we just say, ah, it's just vocabulary, whatever. I'm going to call it a stethoscope. Well, it's a funny thing because now we've advanced. If you go into hospitals, you'll still see this. 90% of them, you'll see this. They already have these. These are actually cheaper than those. And these are electronic stethophones where you actually can hear it. They actually enhance the audio. You can even hear better. Now they're even moving past this. They say, this is kind of stupid too. You can just use these and just use, and just basically see the heart itself or kind of look at fluid. Phone's life. Or if you're stuck in the same way syndrome, and I'm a doctor, by the way, I still use one of these, sadly. If you're stuck in the same way syndrome, you're not using this. You're not making the best diagnosis. And you're not doing what you could actually do. Cheaper price, better outcome. Echoes cost a lot. But if you use this and you get trained on it for about five hours, you could probably do it really fast. We're not there yet, are we? Because we're still stuck in the same way syndrome. All right, so we're going to talk a little today about how to get out of that same way syndrome. All right, sabermetrics, anyone? Anyone know what sabermetrics are? Mark and I were talking about that. Oh, a couple of you. What's sabermetrics, sir? My God, uh, he, he saw this presentation before this, uh, it's just good. He, so it's actually from the Society of American Baseball Research. So why do I show this? I don't know if you, some of you have seen this movie, some of you have not. In the movie, it's Brad Pitt plays this character, it's a real life guy, Billy Bean, right? And he, he changes the way baseball is actually managed. And he says, stop looking at just kind of like random talent and believing a baseball player is good, but actually look at the statistics and break it down and target it appropriately, all right? We're gonna talk about that in medicine, right? I'm an outpatient primary care doctor. I'm an internal medicine doctor. I see patients on average, or one of me sees patients, every 30 minutes. If you're super healthy and you run marathons, guess how long you get? 30 minutes. If you've got 20 medications and 20 disease states, guess how long you get? 30 minutes. Is that money ball? No, it's not even near money ball. And by the way, if you think this, for those who haven't seen the movie, this guy, Billy Bean, he hasn't won a World Series, but you may have heard of like the, the Bambino curse. Remember how that with the Boston Red Sox? They couldn't win a World Series. Since in 2000, from like 19, it was like 20 something to like 2004, the Boston Red Sox never won a World Series. In the last decade, the Boston Red Sox are the winningest team in Major League Baseball. They've won three World Series titles more than any other team in Major League Baseball. How they do it? What do they do? They just shrug off the curse? No, it was this. It was figuring out how to target things in a really targeted fashion. We can apply the same principles to healthcare and health if we get out of the trap of the same way syndrome. All right, so let's talk about that. Population health determinants. I'm gonna to talk to you a little about San Diego County. I grew up in LA County, actually. I grew up about 30 minutes from here. I was born here, I went to high school here, I went to public high school here. Um, Southern California, born and raised. I live in San Diego now. But I'm, so I'm gonna give you some stats on San Diego County to give you a perspective of what you could do in your own population wherever you are. San Diego County is the fifth largest county in the country. It has 3.1 million people. LA County is the biggest county, but San, LA, uh, San Diego County is the fifth largest county in the country, has 3.1 million people. It is bigger than 20 states in America. It's bigger than Alaska, Vermont, and Wyoming combined. San Diego County is, okay? In San Diego County, in this little blue sphere, we spend $24 billion on healthcare. 24 billion, with a B. I'm in the Navy, been in the Navy for about uh, 19 years now, all right? And we care about San Diego County. Why do I care? Because in San Diego County, we pay for 20% of all healthcare, all right? So we spend 20% in this little blue sphere down in San Diego County, and the statistics are varied in every other county and around the country. You know in this yellow sphere where there's community, social, and health services? We spend about one billion in the entire county. That's on public health programs, on private health programs, like gyms, like yoga centers. I call those private health programs. Remember, health is not just the healthcare stuff. It's the health stuff, the wellness stuff. Um, and then there's this ad hoc integration Whereas your social and family and community networks. So let me illustrate it this way. This is where you get macro system breakdown. You start out, you're 13, 15, 18 years old, and you're, 
your friends are telling you, hey, you gotta try this cigarette, right? Why don't you try the cigarettes? Most people don't smoke, but a lot do, right? Why? Because the yellow sphere is a system, right? There's commercials. Everyone's seen those smoking commercials? They're smoking out of their trach pipe, and they're all, you know. Well, someone paid for those commercials, right? Someone educated you, right? That was all this yellow stuff. Someone paid for that. That was $1 billion. But let's say that system fails, right? You start smoking. Now you're 40, and now your spouse tells you, stop smoking. It's bad for you. Stop smoking. Stop smoking. Right, that's the gray zone, right? That's your social family community network. Your friends tell you to do that, etc. Let's say that fails. Finally, you're 65. You get what? You get your friendly, you know, friendly neighborhood lung cancer, <laughs> and off you come doing what? You come running. You come running to the yellow. You want to watch commercials now? No. Do you want to go talk to your wife or your husband? No. Where are you going to come? You're going to come see me, right? I got 24 billion dollars worth of stuff right here to send to you, whether it's drugs, it's chemo, it's MRIs, it's CTs, right? And you come running into the blue. So the yellow broke, the gray failed, and the blue's ready to catch it. Think about that for a moment, right? We spend 24 here in San Diego County, we spend one here, the gray zone, we spend almost nothing. We just hope you get married or have some kids or have a good family, I don't know. Or you hope. If you don't, oh well, right? That's where we live. That's San Diego County, but applies probably to LA County, applies to a bunch of counties, applies to the country. So we need to figure out a way to turn that around and create a bridge. We're spending a lot here. We're not spending much here. How can we take some of the money out of here and put it into here? Who spends on the, on the yellow and the, I told you no one really spends in the white zone, kind of. Who spends in the yellow today? It's this building. It's philanthropy and government. Philanthropy and government predominantly do our health services, isn't it? Right? There's some other stuff, but it's predominantly philanthropy and government. And some of it's private, so you pay for it on your own. Right? Who spends it all in here? Well, we spend a whole bunch in here. So how are we going to expand the yellow? Are we going to go begging more philanthropy and government? Do you really think that's going to happen? Do you think the government's going to come out and, you know, hand out this big chunk of change for you? You get fighting Congress right now for that stuff. Right? So it may not be government. Maybe you have to look into the blue sphere and figure out, well, maybe we can turn that back and put some of the money here into here, especially if we change the incentives, right? If we stop motivating volume, we start motivating value, we can move the dot. Sounds great. A lot of academic talk there, Sonny. How are you going to really do that? <laughs> How are you really going to do that, right? Well, let's talk about that. Because we, got, I mean, we think we have a couple ways of how to actually make that happen. Real quick, healthcare service versus social services. We spend a lot, just to show you some stats here. We spend a bunch on healthcare, right? We're at, everyone here could probably tell me, 17, what is it now recently? 17.2, 17 something like that of GDP? What is it? 17, 18 percentage, right? These other countries aren't spending much, but there's, but if you actually, it's funny though, everyone says they're all spending less and they're getting more and we're just dumb in America. People say that sometimes. That's false. If you look at it kind of globally, they're spending a lot more on social services than we do. And when you actually add their social services expenditures with their healthcare expenditures, and you put ours together, it's about the same. But the problem is, they've distributed things better than we have. They spend more on the stuff that actually gets better results on the health sphere, right? So their life expectancy is better, their infant mortality is better. So they redistribute a little bit differently and they get better results. It's not that hard. Put more money in the yellow, you get better outcomes. Put, more, put all your money in the blue, you get poor outcomes, right? Now I get it out there. There's a couple of the data guys out there in the audience somewhere. Some epidemiologist is gonna tell me, well, did you do a double blind study into this and into that and blah, 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 blah. Okay, fair enough. But you kind of get it, right? You kind of get it. And we can play with the epidemiologists out there, whoever you are. I'd love to have a little sidebar conversation with you. We can play with you too. But this really does suggest hold. So now how do we change this? How do we start spending maybe a little bit more here, spending a little bit more here, a little less here, and maybe getting better outcomes? Our infant mortality is high. Our life expectancy is kind of eh. There's 194 countries on the planet. On the planet Earth, there's about 190, 196, depending on all these civil wars and all that other jazz. We rank 47 or 46 somewhere. We really do. 
So I don't, I mean, do we have the best health care? I don't know. Do we have the best this? Do we have the best that? I don't know. I, I can only just tell you the rankings. You can make the determination yourself. So let's first, another little primer point is cultural health determinants. This is big stuff. Uh, Christakis, Fowler, come out of San Diego a little bit, some of this stuff. Christakis is a guy out of Harvard. Tells you basically all this New England Journal stuff. Uh, let's break it down a little bit simple. If you're smoking, guess who you hang out with? Smokers, right? If you're obese, get your, guess who you hang out with? Other obese people. No, wait, is that just a kind of like a, is that a causal factor or is that just kind of a normative factor? Well, he seems to suggest, well, all these guys are studying, is that cultural pressures define behavior, okay? All of you are sitting here today, okay? You're all very well educated. I venture to say 95%, if not higher, have a bachelor's degree, right? You are, by definition, an anomaly of this country. This room doesn't exist anywhere in this country. It's a very rare room. So when you think about it, how did that happen? It was the cultural pressures in your life, your family, your friends, all that stuff defined your behaviors, defined your intelligence, all that stuff we have to do to motivate behaviors. If we don't, because we know, I mean, this whole healthcare system, it's diet, exercise, tobacco. You solve those three behaviors, you start changing things. It's not so hard. The question is how to do it, right? So other communities are starting to take this to think about how to do this. Because if you want to change culture, you don't want to do same way syndrome, you want to do money ball stuff, you have to think about how to get into the community. If you think that only can all happen into a little bubble of the blue in a healthcare system, in my little hospital or my little clinic, and I can change your behavior somehow in a 30 minute appointment, oh, you give me a 60 minute appointment, ooh, still not gonna do it, right? Or a hospital admission, it's not gonna happen. If we're relying on the blue to change behavior, to, to change the game, it won't happen. We have to figure out how to get into the community. And then the next step is to what we're calling the integrated health community, is to how to integrate those services. Then you can start to change your culture. Then you can start to behave, change behavior. Then you can start to change money outcomes. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about it. Now let's get more specific. A lot of academic blah, 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 right? Now let's go, all right, let's get into the meat here. What are you doing? Show me some results all this theory about? Well, everyone knows about the medical home here, right? I'm not going to waste your time talking about that. We actually started, myself and another doctor, about eight years ago, we started the medical home idea in the military. We drew it up in a, in a hotel, kind of like this room, in like three hours, and then three years later, they put $850 million what we drew up in a hotel. Now, it's still kind of bizarre how they did that. I don't know if I just, you know, shedded your faith in government. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so, Let's take a look at this medical home idea of population health. What is population? You've seen, someone's seen, have you guys seen a diagram like this with the medical home before? Or at least these ideas, right? Team-based care, patient-centered stuff, all that stuff, right? You've seen population health up on there too, probably. Right? These are principles of the medical home. What, what is population health to most of these people? What does that mean? Come on, you guys have some ideas. What is it? The health of their members. How do they measure it typically? Moving encounters, utilization metrics. Sometimes they think of this grand thing called HEDIS, right? HEDIS is, is population health to them, right? Right? To a lot of healthcare systems, it is. What is HEDIS? It's disease management. In fact, if you look at your entire population, how much of your population is affected by any HEDIS metric? A subsection, right? If you really drill down to diabetics, et cetera, even smaller. Now I get it, there's some HEDIS metrics like colonoscopies, mammograms, stuff like that. There are preventive HEDIS metrics out there. But those aren't just population health, right? We have to figure out what are population health metrics. And so that's this. It's primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. The 25-year-old marathon runner who doesn't figure in any HEDIS metric, does he still or she still have a need for primary prevention? The cardiovascular disease person, what, 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 what do we do for secondary prevention? And then finally, what do you do for tertiary prevention? Let's money ball this stuff out. Let's actually give intense services to people who need it in tertiary prevention, and let's give less services to people who don't. Let's not just do the one size fits all, right? And then let's start targeting them with health services, not just health care services, but health services. We're at HIMSS, right? Technology is going to be huge. 
for doing this. If we're really serious about it, it's going to be absolutely huge. Okay? So we'll talk to you a little bit about what we did with this kind of tertiary prevention person focus, and then we'll kind of move on from there. This is our, our kind of management. We, we threw a lot of case managers and high intensity services at tertiary prevention. For those, most probably everyone here knows it, but just in case, primary prevention, no disease, no morbidity. Secondary prevention, disease, no morbidity. Tertiary prevention, disease and morbidity, right? So this is a super healthy person. This person's kind of getting there. This person's not doing so well. What's new? We're going to proactively find people. We're going to target them. We're not going to just play the reactive game. We're going to activate them. Everyone, anyone here know what patient activation? Ever heard of that term? No, kind of, maybe. A few people have. Yeah, patient activation is where patients understand their disease state, they understand their health state, and they understand how to take action on their health and their health care. All right? Everyone, heard, everyone knows the stats on this, right? What percentage, we'll play a little game for a second because I can't talk the whole hour. What percentage of patients walk out of the doctor's office and understand what the provider or doctor just told them? What percentage walk out of the doctor's office and understand what the doctor or provider told them? 10%, 30%, you can pre in the factors of 10, what do you think? 5%, all right, she's going lower. Anyone else over here, come on. No one wants to break the 50% barrier? Everyone says no. Anyone with the above 50%? Well, you're, you're right not putting your hand up. There's no way that anyone's gonna break 50%, right? It's 30%. 30% of people understand what, what's going on. You were right, right? 30% of people understand what's going on at the prior. Do you, you've been to a doctor, haven't you? Do you remember every single thing that that doctor told you? Do you, rem do you understand half that stuff? You, remember, you're not, you're not the typical American, right? You're already a subsection of like super educated, super awesome people, <laughs> right? You're already there. And if you don't get it, how are those folks getting it, right? So patient activation is a huge kind of piece, all right, is making sure that they understand. That's going to be through technology, activation tools, community partnerships. If we try to activate it and live in the blue and just have a healthcare system do it, we will likely fail. Why do I say that? Because I believe it. No, I say that because I have, I don't know, this idea of 50 years of history. The healthcare system hasn't done it. You think they're somehow going to magically do it now? We don't have the time or the ability to. It's got to be out in the community with technology and activation tools. Remember my first statement? People who can figure this out can make a gazillion dollars. I'm in the Navy. We'll pay you. I don't care. <laughs> just, uh, let's just figure it out. We're connecting all levels of prevention. We need to connect this all together and integrate it. What we do in the healthcare system, we silo this stuff out all the time. You guys know this. I got one little thing for your one little population. I got another little thing for the other population. If you integrate this up, people can move seamlessly over time. So here is the current model that we have in the military. We have our medical home. You have your primary care system, wherever your health care system serves as well, right? You have a little primary care system. You have health and wellness services. Sometimes in the military, we tell people to come to our base and we have a free gym for them. So we have our little health and wellness services. People have that too. And then there's community and social services. Most people, especially in the healthcare world, don't understand the power. They don't really, they don't understand. They've just never been exposed to the power of community and social services. I'll illustrate it this way. Where's my phone? Here it is. If I call 911 on this thing, I can get a cop or an ambulance show up right now, right? Everyone knows 911, right? Everyone knows what, does anyone know what 211 is? Who, who knows what 2 one is? Put, up, put your hands up. Uh, all right, so not many people know what 2 one is. Or either that or they got something wrong on their arm today. That's all right, either way. <laughs> uh, either way, 2 one one you walk out right now, call 2 one one You will get a directory of community and social services right here. It's available in 36 states in the country. Did you know about it? In San Diego, in San Diego, we have one of the most robust 2 one ones community so and you can Google it, Google 2 one in your county, and you probably have one right now. Oh, so that's for all the, you know, the indigent people who need all the free stuff. That's not for my patient population. They'll never go. Long answer. I've been to a lot of those places myself, personally toured them. Some of those community wellness services are better than the stuff I've got at my own hospital. Straight up. 
straight up. That's where philanthropy and government are putting money in. We kind of make fun of some of that stuff sometimes, but some of it's actually really good. I've got, we got a senior center. It's about five blocks from my house downtown, San Diego. Um, it's open 365 days a year. It gives free meals out. Actually, good meals. I had a meal there. Um, they've got a doctor, a nurse, and a behavioral health uh, psychologist who see anybody for anything all the time. So where the, where's the funding coming for this philanthropy? It's out there. The county is responsible a lot of this stuff, but we don't integrate that stuff very well. So we're working in San Diego right now to integrate a lot of that stuff together so we can push people to get services out in their community so we can change behavior, so we can change culture. All right, so that's, that's some of those the community social services that exist. This is currently what's happening, and we measure stuff by, you know, I put some metrics in the bottom of like, uh, this is the stuff that we actually kind of look at. I mean, we want to lower ERUs, we want to lower inpatient emissions, we want to maximize HEDIS, PCM continuity, all that jazz. This is kind of a new model. Oh, it gets all busy now. Um, of what we want to do. You hit your primary care system still. Now you have your AICU, which is your ambulatory intensive care unit. I'll say it again, ambulatory intensive care unit. So you actually start to moneyball your segment, your segment of your population. You give intense services to those who need it. Okay? You case manage, you proactively find patients using technology. There's a lot of tools out there. You guys are familiar with some of them, whether they be Johns Hopkins ACG Grouper, United's uh, Optum's Impact Pro tool. There's a lot of these predictive modeling tools that can actually find who is going to be your high-cost tertiary prevention population. You tackle them, you save a ton of money. Okay? Then you start to have health coaches that actually help patients and beneficiaries start using health and wellness services, guide them. And then you have uh, what we call our IHC portal. You can go to www.sdihc.org, San Diego Integrated Health Community.org. We actually tabulate all of our kind of health community services. So anyone can go in and just say diabetes education. Put their zip code in, hit enter, and you'll see services that exist right there where you live. Most of them are free. And so our healthcare system is trying to integrate with that community. And then you got a lot of health coaches that help guide you and then wellness specialists that start kind of moving back and forth and help you kind of help the patient, I should say, understand how to use health and community and social services to become activated, to lower utilization, to get healthy. Because again, beneficiaries do not like health care. <laughs> they do not like going to the doctor as much as I'm a doctor. They don't like coming seeing me. They don't like MRIs. You don't like MRIs. You don't like CTs. You don't like needles in your arm. You don't like that. What you want is health. We're trying to figure out ways to give it to them. We just got to help them motivate a little bit of that behavior change for them. Okay. Here's our model of how we've done it a little bit in our medical home. We've got our primary care team. We've got our ambulatory intensive care unit. We've got these things, behavioral health, health coaches, uh, physical therapy, dietitians, and we've got our community social services out there. Just like we call our behavioral health, just for those who don't know, behavioral health and our health coaches, you have to want to play the game, all right? It's like baseball. When you were, say you want to ask some people, anyone play baseball when they were in high school? Anyone in the audience? Oh, we got one person here, we got one person. A couple play play baseball. You play baseball, sir? Well, you on your varsity team? Wow, we got a super stud here. Um, where'd, you go to, where'd you go to high school? Where's that? Massachusetts, right outside Boston, right? Right, all right, so you went to Brooklyn, which is right outside the Brigham, actually, not too far, right? Yeah, he's a smart guy, too. So, so why did you want to play baseball? It was fun. Why did you really want to play baseball? Was there some like, cute girl out there? What was it? So he enjoyed sports. So did you get, did you get, how, did you just start on the varsity team? Were you always just like super awesome or did you actually have to like graduate up? And you were on the varsity team? So how did you get better? He kept practicing. Who helped you? Coaches. So, right, lesson. He was activated, he wanted to play the game. Two, he wanted to get better. Coaches helped him get better, right? Simple stuff. Are patients activated? Do patients want to play the game all the time? Do they want to stop smoking? Do they want to get on that diet? Do they want to pick up that carrot and put down the cookie? Do they? No, they need to be activated. Even after they're activated, they still need coaching to actually get them there. Behavioral health is your activation piece. 
Coaching is getting you there. That's what we needed part of our system. It's the Santa Claus out there. This is a, you know, our Christine Kringle, fake names. This is a, a little busy here, but let me show you what we do. We give this to our case managers. We give the scorecard. By the way, this is an Excel rinky-dinky thing that I bet every single one in this room, and not everyone here is super technology savvy, but I bet you a lot of people in this room could blow this out of the water. I mean, like all we do is we show people, we show the providers direct care costs, purchase care costs, primary care visits, ER visits. We call them purchase and direct cares. In the military, we provide care in our hospitals and we actually purchase it out in the civilian sector. So we have a, and we, we try not to do a lot of civilian care because we'd rather do it in our hospitals. It's cheaper for us. Just like in other healthcare systems, kind of like a Kaiser. We show our providers some of this, this data and that where these patients are spiking so they can be detectives and figure out what are the causes of why patients are spiking, why they're actually doing this. Why are they going to the ER a bunch of times? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever heard, of, have you heard like the solution to the healthcare system is better coordination? Have you heard of that term, coordination? What the heck does that mean? When you really start to dig it up, what does coordination mean? Does that mean I just call you after you've gone to the ER and say, why did you go to the ER? He's like, well, I fell. Oh, oh okay, bye. I mean, what, do, what does coordination mean? When you have a bunch of complex diseases, now it means you're getting to be activated, getting you to make your HEDIS metrics better, getting you to be healthy, right? But then again, you may need your coach and your activator, right? Like our friend, right? You can't just be navigating you around the system. So there's a lot of ways that we've trained our case managers in our healthcare delivery system to actually do something different than what they're used to doing. Most doctors, most case managers, most nurses, frankly, they're all, they didn't go into the business for this, but they've turned into firefighters. They know how to put out the fire, right? But if you ask them to do prevention, not so good at it. I've been doing this for, I've been doing this medical thing for about 15 years, all right? This little doctoring thing. <laughs> Am I good at prevention? Am I good at changing your behavior? I see a lot of obese patients. Am I good at changing their behavior? I'll put my hand in the air right now. I suck. I really suck. I've got a couple success stories and I can tout them. Woo, and I'm really excited about them. But all in all, I have a better than, I have a less than 50% success rate, honestly. And I really spend time, I try. I mean, I start, I mean, listen to all the PhD psychologists and try and try and try and try. I fail. So, I mean, I wonder how the system's doing, right? And that's just not on obesity, which is one level. It's the tertiary prevention stuff, right? So we're training our case managers how to do this, to find out the underlying cause, to get them to the behavioral health therapist, to get them to the right community service, to navigate them right, and then we use this thing called a patient activation measure, where you actually activate them and measure how activated they are. All right, this is what we've done on our, in, our, our impact. Some of these results are not perfect, but we have intervened on 150 people. Our algorithm for identification, uh, for identification used one of those predictive modeling techniques, the ACG Optum. You, you guys heard of those things? It has disease management programs. You run them through. They run through your claim stuff, and they can tell you who's going to use healthcare a lot before they've, done, before they've done it. Anyone see that movie, Minority Report? Tom Cruise, right? If you haven't, it was based on this idea that um, the whole theory of the movie is he was gonna go out there and snatch people before they committed crimes. Before you committed a murder, we're gonna put you in jail. And then of course the movie gets better when he's the one who's identified as going to be the next murderer, right? So same thing here, we actually have to predict people before they actually use healthcare utilization a lot. The problem with that though, just like in the movie, is if you didn't spend a lot before, and I intervened on you, and then you spend nothing again, everyone, all the, all the leaders, i.e. you people, look at me and say, you didn't do anything. <laughs> so we actually combined our algorithm to find people who actually did spend a lot, and also were predicted to spend a lot. We found about 150 people, we started with that in our system. They spent, on average, uh, as you can see right here, they, you know, it was about 50,000 per person. It was a total of 6.3 million. We intervened on them, they're down to three million. Simple put, right? ER visits down, inpatient admissions down, um, PCM visits down, specialty care visits down, right? Tertiary prevention, you save money, you get people healthy, 
on a small subsection of 150 people. That's on church prevention. Now we need, slide. love to talk to anybody here after this, call, after this little talk here. How do you do primary and secondary prevention to where it's not only shows you an ROI in a longer time period, right? Because secondary primary prevention take on a longer ROI period, but also what's sticky. In other words, who's going to use whatever technology tool you got for me? You got a technology tool for me? Everyone, look how sh cool. Let me show you this stuff on my iPad that'll work in my app and my this and my that. I love it. But I got 15% of my patients using it. 85% just don't even use it. How can you help us figure out ways to get that better? That's neat. Because then you can get into secondary and primary prevention. Then we can start really changing the game and really being money bubble. Um, let's see what else I got. I got some other stuff here. This isn't internet available, is it? Does this have internet, Joanne? Where's Joanne? This doesn't have internet, does it? Oh, it does? Nah, it's probably too late. I was going to show you some other stuff. I can show you some tools, but, but if I can't, then um, where is it? Nah, it doesn't matter. Why don't we start some uh, questions and answers? Question and answers time. Um, I think that's about it. And that's all I have to say right now. I can show you some tools, but if I can't get those, then uh, we'll just go through questions and answers. I'd like, love to talk to you a little bit about what I've done in terms of how we've done this and what we can do to make it better and what your thoughts are. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question over here to your right. Hi, my name is Lori Olson. Um, Hi, Lori. Hello. Um, I've got a question on the population health management for the elderly and kind of how or if you've approached it in that you have more and more people growing older and they may not even use remote devices. So the coolest app in the world isn't going to work if they won't, won't work on a cell phone, if they won't use an iPad. Um, you know, have you guys uh, approached that at all in terms of seniors? That's an excellent question. Um, and we've actually experienced what you're talking about. You know, we try to get them on a PHR, and, and they're like, I don't have a computer at home. You're like, uh oh. Um, uh, that's an excellent point, too. They don't even want one. Like, hey, you want one? No. How about you use your kids? No. Oh, OK. Um, th the only way to actually change, there's a couple theories on how we've done it. Number one is uh, it's got to be activation of the family members. Um, and you pull them in, well, you don't, well, give me your daughter's address. I don't know my daughter's, do you have your daughter's phone? Almost everyone we found at least has a cell phone. They don't have smartphones, maybe some of them, but almost all of them have cell phones, even in the elderly population. So we've used that to tie in with their family members and activate them and get them on these systems, number one. And number two, it's old school stuff. In other words, you just got to go back to the counting them the piece of paper, having the telephonic stuff, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that's the only stuff that we could think of that would actually be somewhat effective. Let me, before we ask the next one, let me ask another corollary question to add on you. Well then, what's the percentage of folks who are hitting like that, who are just not even gonna be, who you just can't touch technology-wise, whether they be elderly or you know, non-elderly. We've seen around like, I don't know, 20, 30 something percent of like just one of these kind of things that are not gonna be hit by technology as much. So it's either change the game with them, i.e. teach them how to use technology, which could be challenging, or activate some of them, activate the people who are close to them, their family members, or figure out ways in which your staff or these telephonic old school methods, if you call it, can use technology better to then, it's got like the technology is behind them and still funnels through like an old school type of mentality, which is a telephonic paper, whatever. But technology is used behind the scenes to target them, to figure out what the intervention should be, to figure out what the behavior change should be, and then it's just almost just implementation. That's what some of our health coaches are doing now. What's next? I've got a question here. One more here, somewhere here. Do you have a question? Someone here. Someone put their hand up. Right. No, you did it. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Mike, coming up. Oh. Having a difficult time getting them to play along. Have you tried making it a part of the patient experience when they see the doctor? Meaning that when they go to the doctor, part of the experience is them using a mobile device 
to enter their information in. It becomes part of the experience. They get comfortable in it, whether it just be hitting accept or whatever, but they have, they get experience using the device. I mean, I know this has been useful for my father, who's 78. He became activated when they wouldn't give him his medication and he wanted to know his formulary. So I said, well, hey, you're gonna look it up. You're gonna figure it out. And he did, because he had now a vested interest. So that's, I just, out of curiosity. I think that's an excellent idea. I think that that's, what, that's probably the only way to do it. I'll give you an example in the military, what we did. Have you guys heard of what, um, everyone knows the VA system, VISTA, Electronic Medical Record? Do you know the military system, the ALTA? That, uh, ALTA VISTA, that's why they created the names. They wanted it to join it, call it ALTA VISTA. Um, but so to your point, Alta was something that no one liked. They still don't like it, but now everyone uses it. Why? Because it was forced on them, just like your father you mentioned. What we've experienced has been unfortunate in that when you keep the old pathway open, they go down the old pathway. So if you tell them, hey, you can check in on mobile, or you can call and check in, or you can do the old school way, they always, almost always, go down the old school way. The problem with our system is, honestly, because of patient satisfaction, because we're in government, right? I mean, so, uh, patient and satisfaction is important. We've kept the old way open, and when we do, I don't think we shift it as much to the new way. Like in Alta, we didn't allow the old way open anymore. There is no more paper records. It's gone. Like you can't, even if you try to, you can't do it anymore. Everyone now learned, will use, does use Alta. I think the only way to get over those issues is to literally shut off the old school method, which is troublesome because it only takes three or four or one or two anecdotes for where you shut it off and a bad outcome happens and then everyone just goes like this. And so that's kind of the, the tug of war that we're slowly experiencing in the transformation phase is that we're shutting down a little bit of the old school methods, we're making the, the, the new school methods a lot easier, but we're not there yet, honestly. Hi, my name is Marie London, and I'm from Healthcare Partners. Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I had lunch with an old professor of mine who um, told me that the biggest problem, the biggest challenge they were having was that they had the Sesame Street generation was hitting college. Kids who had grown up with loads of Sesame Street kind of programs their whole life, and they were used to education being entertaining. Mm and that they weren't prepared for that in this little liberal arts college that I went to. Fine, fine school, but they were kind of stunned that their, their students kept dropping out thinking that they were incompetent professors. When in fact, it was that they weren't teaching these students the way they wanted to learn. And I've been in healthcare now almost 30 years, and I find that I still find myself sometimes teaching patients the way I want them to learn, and not making it fun or entertaining. And I think we have the reality that if we have that many people who are voluntarily using Angry Birds on their mobile devices, we have to consider having that very kind of thing on a mobile device that will sneakily, maybe, teach them about preventive care. It may be the old put the carrots in the, the applesauce trick with kids, I don't know. But we have to have something that's fun and entertaining but also makes patients feel like it's their choice, you know, and combining it with the whole motivational uh, health interviewing and whatnot, um, a lot of, for anybody spending time with motivational health, a lot of it is actually good sales techniques, right? It's listening to what they're telling you, and it's also knowing when not to sell them something they don't want. So if they are smoking three packs a day and are being repeatedly admitted for COPD, but they are not interested in smoking cessation, but they are interested in losing weight and they're 100 pounds overweight, a good salesperson that worked at any store would say, oh, you're interested in buying that, let me show you that. They're not gonna continue to hammer on this other product. And we have a hard time accepting that in healthcare because we're the clinicians, we feel that this is your more important problem, why won't you listen to me, I'm the boss, and that has to shift. So. Can you speak to fun and entertainment and, for lack of a better term, good sales techniques and that shift and what needs to happen? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the challenge uh, I feel that I was uh, talking about uh, a little bit at the beginning, which is, it's tough stuff, right? I mean, like, we have, um, I'm trying to show you the one, one of the slides that 
Yeah, what you're talking about is right here. Yeah, this kind of primary prevention in this kind of sphere to make it really sticky and to really want it to be healthy and fun and exciting. There's a couple companies out there that do this, that are at least trying to do this, the kind of frontiers folks who have health coaches and have this kind of gaming platform. And you can, first you, game, you make it entertaining and you gamification, right? You gamify this, right? Then another key principle is to really bring in social media because it's not just playing a game. It's where all your friends are playing the game and all your friends are competing with you to play the game, right? Then you start to really move into this kind of like primary prevention sphere. I've run a couple marathons. I don't know if I would have done it if a couple of my friends weren't doing it with me, right? I mean like to do challenging, running a marathon was, oh, oh my goodness, 26 miles. Oh. For some people honestly losing 20 pounds is like running a marathon. 26 miles is like 26 pounds. I mean, it's like, it's really tough. So they need support. So the social media, there's companies out there, I and mean, I can list a bunch of them that we're looking at right now, that are doing that, trying to figure that out. We're probably gonna contract with a couple of those guys to figure out ways to, to do that. I think that's the way, where we're having challenges with is integrating that with, integrated health community is integrating that with healthcare. These things live in silos outside and they gamify you, and they social media you, and they do this, and that, and the other. But I, as a healthcare system, don't know how healthy you've been. I can tell you your labs for the last 40 years. I can tell you how many MRIs you've got. If you ask me how many times you worked out in the last year, I go, I don't know. Please tell me. Well, now with Fitbits and all these other things, I can figure that out. So we were working with companies to actually create what you're talking about. And this is, like, this is not super new. Like For four or five years, people have been doing this. I can give you a list after this, a list of companies to potentially consider. Some of them are effective, some of them are not. The stickiness is really hard, right? It's really, it's hard to get to the sticky principle. Our theory is if you integrate this, it'll be more sticky. People come to the doctor, they love that blue part of the sphere, right? They, they, they will come running, but if you, they don't love it, but they come running to it. I don't know, it's bizarre, but, <laughs> but, um, if you tell them to go running to the, to the yellow, go run to the gym, <laughs> right? So that's the tough part that we're trying to figure out. I hope that kind of answers it, but it's, it's these companies that will probably be doing it far better than I as a clinician. <laughs> yeah, over here. Well, we have a question here first. Hi, Jan Oldenburg. Um, Hi, Jane. Your patient scorecard, yeah. have you thought about sharing that with patients or having a version that patients see? If you think about open notes and the success of open notes projects in getting patients to really understand what they need to do next, how about your scorecard? Oh, well, that's an excellent idea. You know what? We have not even, uh... <laughs> that's interesting. Um, we never did that because <laughs> we're stupid. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, 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 no, actually, an excellent idea. It, to be honest with you, it, it, it has taken a long time to educate our staff on how to use this scorecard. All right, um, but maybe it's something that we need to start um, into the patient sphere. That's an excellent point. What I, I'm trying as, as your question, as you're answering your as you're asking your question, I was thinking, oh, we haven't done it. That was dumb. And then I was like, well, why didn't we do it? Um, the reason we haven't done it is that it is time intensive to hand out someone's scorecard, you probably need some explanation of it. And that means someone would have to be very well knowledgeable about how to use the scorecard, et cetera. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good point. To educate the coaches and then figure out how we can show it to them. That's an excellent, excellent point. We need to probably do that. The scorecard we've used a lot for tertiary prevention, it would be really, and we haven't done this. This is honestly just a, a couple of guys in our data shop creating this, but I'm sure like, technology savvy folks like the folks at HIMSS, if we could do this along all three prevention lines, that would be powerful. Then you gamify it, you social mediaize it, then you're, talk, then you're talking, right? Then you start and it has its own instruction thing. This isn't, I mean, the entrepreneur out there, whoever you are out there in the audience, I mean, this stuff, we would buy that in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. And I bet you a lot of healthcare systems with new, these new exchanges coming online, with all these folks coming on, with the metrics moving to value as opposed to volume, these things are critical, absolutely critical. That's a great point. 
Um, my name is Vladimir. I'm kind of new to the healthcare field, and my background is IT and entertainment. So healthcare is no entertainment, as you can see. Um, but I have a two-part question. A is what happens um, to privacy issues when you bring in a third-party activator, so to say? And that's number one thing. And number two, who pays for patient activation, patient um, education generally? So let's, let's deal with both parts. Um, let's start with your second part first, which is uh, who pays for patient activation? It depends on, that's an excellent point. The, the financial incentive structure is a little distorted, right? For most doctors out there, at least primary care doctors, if you stay sick, I get more money, right? You come see me, I get more money. If you stay well, you stay healthy, you go run your marathons, you take your vitamins right, and you eat right, you don't come see me, that's things for me, right? So it has to be as we move more to the ACO model. A lot of healthcare systems are now moving to the ACO model. I'm in the military. I'm in the, the, the socialized medicine world, if you call it. You know, where so for us, we pay for it, right? Because if we don't, we'll pay for healthcare on the back end, right? We'll start paying for the blue. We need to get smarter and start paying in the yellow. And that and this kind of we need to start paying in the yellow right here, right? So healthcare systems that are not in that kind of ACO framework, we're still on the kind of fee-for-service volume-based system, that's going to be tough for them. They're not going to be wanting to do that, so then it's going to be in the community and the individual incentive themselves. So people with their co-payments, et cetera, will hopefully want to do that, but as we've seen with population health disease states over the last 20 years, that's not happening very well. Now maybe when it gets more expensive, maybe it will, but that's a 30-year shift. That would probably take a long time. Um, I think as the exchanges come online, however, those metrics will start to shift. We'll start moving to value. Healthcare systems will start to happen, and this bridge will start to happen to where the blue money will shift out, and money starts going into the yellow and the, and the gray, activation will occur. Your next question was about privacy. The way, this is a very, very touchy subject, especially when people start to put in all their healthcare stuff all on these kind of platforms. The only way to potentially navigate that, just theorizing here, I'm no lawyer, but is to say it's got to be voluntary and they've got to be knowledgeable of what they put on there and they actually have to be knowledgeable of the risks. You put some, if I put something into my electronic healthcare system in the military, in the government, it's secure and all this other jazz and locked down and there was some story, wasn't there some story recently about someone had a VA record and they left it somewhere or a computer got stolen? You guys remember that? Yeah, some, someone in the VA, like, they lost a whole bunch of records and the whole, like, world went crazy, right? Because we've got it all secure, right? And when you release that, everyone goes crazy. In this world, no one's going to go crazy, right? So if patients are knowledgeable about that, they're volunteering for that, they're willing to accept those risks, that's probably the way of the, to kind of to jump over that. The final way will be to integrate all of that and then create that security bubble around all of that. But as you know, there's prices and there's pros and cons to all type of security, whatever they may be. And, that, and the biggest one for this is going to be accessibility. And so we want to make it more accessible in the beginning. We want people to take that, you know, that step and putting a bunch of security bubbles around that stuff can sometimes impede uh, usability. I don't want to make it really hard for you to go to the gym. <laughs> it's already hard enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Same thing. When I put a, cook, a carrot and a cookie next to you, I mean, I'm already fighting so many forces. I don't want to put locks around the carrot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I have to give you the mic. This may be the last question, too, because we're supposed to wrap at 1.30. Sounds good. Your work is um, with um, the military. But I was wondering if the community, social, and health services were uh, military oriented or funded by the military, or were they this, um, related to the city of San Diego itself? That's a great, another great question. Um, we have worked really closely with the county. Um, in San Diego, uh, the county runs most of the health and public health services there. Uh, really closely with them over the last three years. Most of these community services are run by the county run by philanthropy, run by public government, county government, state government, not the military. We've put a couple of the military services in there, 
but most of it is outside the military. Our vision and our hope is to have other healthcare systems also join up and put their yellow services on this kind of portal so everyone can have the same access to everything. Um, were the programs that were part of the community, were, were there specific programs that you were using for prevention? Um, the specific programs, so we use a bunch, a, a couple of them. A lot of them have to do with education. A lot of them have to do with disease management. And a lot of them have to do with like wellness education. What were the, some of the specific disease management programs? Like diabetes education. Um, trying to think of a specific, um, we, for example, you have like a, a nurse educator at the senior center. You know, so now if, if, I'm, if I'm a patient, I'm diabetic, my A1C is out of whack. Right now, the traditional was three years ago, you have to come see me and I would educate you at my hospital system 30 minutes away and you'd come talk to my nurse educator on their clinic appointment, which is three weeks from now. And now we're saying, stop, let's go on this portal. Oh, there's a nurse educator 10 minutes from your house and they're available next week. Actually, you can walk in. Why don't you go talk to them? And then let's talk in three weeks and let's see what you learn. If there's any more gaps, we'll take care of it then. That's how we've kind of like tapped into some of those community resources. And they, and then help, it's a win-win because they are motivated a lot by volume two. Like when no one's seeing them, they get defunded. So remember who's funding them, right? Philanthropy and government. So they want to churn patients and people, et cetera, et cetera, the same way. I want to thank you guys very, very much. Um, this was really, really great. And we had a good time. I have to do the last disclaimer, as you see on the bottom. The views are just myself, not the position of the government, blah, 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 blah. But not the official position of anyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay.